Good morning, everyone. Over the last eight weeks, we have been journeying with Jesus through which book? The book of Matthew. And as we've been going on that journey, we have been learning about this upside-down kingdom of Jesus. And we've been going on this journey together when we come together each Saturday morning. But also this is a journey that we've been going through in our own time as well. Um, some of you would be going through our reading plan. And, um, and so this is something that we're, we're, we've been doing collectively and going through the book of Matthew. And what I really hope that has been your experience so far is that you're not only learning more about Jesus, but that you're actually coming closer to Jesus in this process as well. Now, one of the things that I like to do when I'm reading through the stories of Jesus is to, when I finish reading the passage, to actually stop and really reflect on that story and try to enter in, into the scene of what I've just, um, just read. And so I like to think about who are the different characters in this story and what are the different perspectives of what is, what is going on here. What are these people feeling? What are they seeing? What are they smelling? What are they, wh wh what's, the, what's the experience like for those people in this, in this scene? And the reason I like doing this is because when you do that, you start to really understand what this story meant to those original people that first were a part and actually lived this story. And when you get understand what it meant for them, then you're in the best position to then figure out what this story actually means for us as well. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to basically do that. We're going to, I've got a story from this week's readings that we're going to go through together. We're going to read the passage. Then we're going to spend some time just entering into the story thinking about it, trying to just place ourselves on that, in that scene, and then we'll ask the question, what does it mean for us today? So the story we're going to read is Matthew 21, verse 1 to 11, and this is the place in, 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 this, in Matthew where Jesus is finally recognized and celebrated as the king that he is. And this is quite a remarkable moment because for 33 years, Jesus has... Being, being the king of the universe has been living amongst us, has been walking those dusty streets of Israel, and he has gone almost entirely unrecognized. And a verse that comes to my mind when I think of this is John chapter 1 and verse 10, which says, says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And just consider that. Here is the, the being that actually created everything that we see, and now he's amongst us, and he's walking amongst us, and for 33 years, he goes almost entirely unrecognized. Sure, there are some private moments with people where they realize who Jesus really is, and they acknowledge that, but as far as this a public, widespread cele celebration of this, it doesn't happen until we get to this story. And it makes me think of... Um, you might have seen that, that old TV show, Undercover Boss. Does anyone remember that show? Where they would get a, a CEO of some big company and he would uh, step away from his office and put off his suit and he would dress like a first, a very a new employee and he would go in and just live and work amongst his company undercover for a week or so. And the people completely don't know who it is that they're interacting with. And that's kind of like the story of Jesus. Jesus, for 33 years, is living amongst us, and he goes, he's undercover, he's, he goes mostly unrecognized until we get to this story here. So let's read, we're going to read this story together. And what I hope you get challenged with today is just, the, I, want to, I want you to feel challenged by the thought of what does it mean for Jesus to be our king today. So Matthew chapter 21 and verse 1. Let's read through this together. Um, now, if you've got the turquoise Bibles there um, from your chair in front, it's page 847. So 847, Matthew 21. Let's read it through together. Okay, the story goes. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. 
This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So here's this scene. And I've tried to sort of create this scene here. And it looks kind of busy and chaotic because this was a busy and chaotic scene. But let's try to step our way through this and try to place ourselves in this story. So who are the characters here? Well, the first character I want to point out is not Jesus, but who Jesus is on top of, and that is the donkey. And so here's this donkey. Matthew says that, it was, that this donkey was a colt, which meant that it was this young donkey, old enough to be ridden, yet young enough to still be tied up next to its mother. And it's interesting when you read the Gospel of Luke that gives this same story, he actually, he actually mentions that this was an unridden donkey. So just I want you to use your imagination now and, and try to picture what would this have been like when Jesus hopped on this donkey. Now we're not told, but it's fun to sort of picture the scene. Was this donkey, because it had never been ridden and was untrained, was it a city? Was it afraid to jump and bark and eventually it calmed down? Or did Jesus hop on this donkey and it kind of just recognized who Jesus was and just calmly and proudly walked beneath Jesus? I don't know. But it's fun to try to imagine what this would have been like. Now, the donkey wouldn't have been the only animal here in this scene on this day because there was a, probably a whole bunch of these there as well, these little lambs. Now, you might be thinking, I didn't read about that in the story. But as you read the chapters around this passage, this was Passover time. And Passover was a big deal in Jerusalem. Passover was the festival when the Jewish families from all over the region, far and wide, came on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the time when Jesus had delivered them from Exodus. They were slaves, they were slaves in Egypt, and at the Exodus was a story where Jesus had delivered them from that. And a part of that was this Passover lamb. So imagine here, this is not just a random crowd, but this is a group of pilgrims here. These are pilgrims who have been journeying far and wide. They're probably there with their families. They've got animals. They've got, they're dusty from the travels. And they're there coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now, another thing I want you to think about is who are some of these people that might be standing there in this audience who are honoring Jesus on this day? Now, because these people were from far and wide, they were probably, a lot of them were not locals. And a lot of them were probably people from places where Jesus had already been previously in his ministry, where he had taught, where he had performed miracles. And probably quite a number of these people were not only people that had heard Jesus and witnessed his miracles, but had actually experienced them himself. I want you to imagine in this, in this crowd being people who had actually been healed by Jesus. I want you to imagine maybe there's a, a man who had been blind that Jesus had healed and he's there leading this procession on this day. Maybe there's another person who, who used to not be able to speak but Jesus had healed that person and, and now they are leading this, 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 this declaration and these shouts of praise. Maybe there's someone who could not walk before they met Jesus and now they are leaping in and rejoicing that Jesus is here. Maybe there's a leper who used to be shunned from society and no one would want to touch anything that they touch. But here is this leper now with this cloak that is, that is undefiled, and un, that is this clean cloak, laying it down for Jesus to walk upon. And another character who was probably there was someone by the name of Lazarus. Now this area where they were right at this time was just on the other side of the Mount of Olives, which is right where Bethany was, where Lazarus lived. And the Gospel of John, it actually says that the night before this, Jesus was staying with Lazarus, who had recently been raised from the dead. 
Can you imagine being here in this scene and there's Lazarus, there's Mary and Martha, there's all these, these people that have been witnesses and, and people who have personally experienced incredible miracles there as part of this celebration of Jesus. So those are some of the characters that would have been here in this scene. Now, what are these people looking at as they are standing there and as they're walking with Jesus? They all seem to be looking at something in this picture, don't they? What are they looking out at? Well, when you read this, the, the passage before, Jesus began this journey originally in Galilee, and then he went to Jericho, and then he made his way to up over the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. And a lot of this crowd as well was also going on this same pilgrimage journey. And so it's quite interesting when you actually consider the geography of that road that they were on from Jericho to um, Jerusalem. Now Jericho is famous for a number of things. We might think of it as the place where the walls fell down back in the old, that story of the Old Testament. But something else that Jericho is famous for is that Jericho is actually the lowest city on earth. Did you know that? See there it's minus 258 meters below sea level. And just nearby is the Dead Sea, which is minus 430 meters, the lowest place on earth. And this region here is, is very desolate. It's a desert, it's sandy, it's harsh. And this is where this part of the journey begins. Now, when I was in Israel um, a bit over a decade ago, I was actually on the road, which is now a road you drive on, um, between uh, Jerusalem and Jericho. And here's a picture of what that road looked like. So this is a very dry, deserty area. But here's the thing. From Jer Jericho, you take this continually uphill journey up to sea level, then up to Bethphage and Bethany, then the top of the Mount of Olives. And when you get over the top of the Mount of Olives, everything changes. And it's this great sort of climactic, triumphant part of the journey where you look out over Jerusalem. This is what one writer says about this moment in the journey. N.T. Wright says, At last you exchange barren, dusty desert for lush green growth, particularly at Passover time at the height of spring. So this is desert to like greenery and, and, and beautiful land. At last you stop climbing. You crest the summit and there before you, glistening in the sun, is the holy city, Jerusalem itself. And that was the way the pilgrims came, with Jesus going on ahead, as he had planned all along. This was to be the climax of his story, of his public career, of his vocation. So here is this group of people, and they're right at this point, and they're looking out, and they look out at the city, they look out at Jerusalem, they look out at the temple. Do you want to see a picture of what that looks like? Well, here's a picture from when I was there. And... So that sort of corner there is right where the temple used to be. So when you go over the Mount of Olives, you look down over the valley and you just get this spectacular um, view of Jerusalem, of the temple. And you can imagine these pilgrims coming up over that hill and their hearts just being filled with pride of this is their, the center of their nation. But also their hearts, when they looked out, they would have seen, remembered that they were under Roman rule at this time. Things were not as they were supposed to be. And so while they would have had this feeling of pride, they would have had this longing for deliverance, this longing for salvation from this situation that they were from. But it would have been a rejoicing moment and maybe they were jumping up like we are there in the picture as well. Now, that's what they were seeing. What were they hearing at this time? What were they hearing at this part of the story? Now, in Matthew 21, it said that they were crying out things, shouting out things like this. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what is this son of David thing all about? Well, for the, for the people at this time, they, David was a very significant character because he was the king that had conquered Jerusalem. He was the one that really had God had used to forge the, the original uh, kingdom of Israel. And, and so they would have looked back to that time and longed for a time like that as well. But more than that, the Old Testament has all of these prophecies about how one day there will be a descendant of David who once again will rule on the throne. And this descendant of David, also known as the Messiah, would bring about this incredible deliverance and will establish not just 
another nice period of kingdom, but would actually bring in this eternal kingdom that, that had been prophesied. And so when they said, Hosanna to the son of David, they were recognizing that this person, Jesus, was that promised Messiah. He was that king that, had been, that they had been looking forward to. And so imagine all of these things all sort of coming together. Here are these pilgrims. There's this Passover. They're remembering how, how Jesus had rescued them from, from uh, Egypt. They've just come over the top of the Mount of Olives. They're looking at the city. There's all of this enthusiasm about, about who they are as a people. There's this longing for Jesus to rescue them. Then there's Jesus on this donkey. Maybe some of them remembered that prophecy that Matthew mentioned where not only was this a king coming, but this king would arrive on a donkey. And they all, real, they all put the pieces of the puzzle together and they start to cheer and they start to rejoice and they honor and they celebrate Jesus as king. Now, you might think, son of David, well, that's not too explicit, but some of the other passages say things like, that they were saying things like this, not just blessed is the son of David, but blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, in addition to this, you remember how they were laying down their cloaks and they were um, waving those palm branches around? Well, these things also connected with all sorts of other parts of their history as well. Let me give you an example. In the Old Testament, there's this king by the name of Jehu. I don't know if you remember him from our King series. But Jehu was someone who God asked Elisha to anoint as king. And the interesting thing about his story is that he was anointed as king while there was another king or still on the throne. And you know what those people did? They let, took off their cloaks, they laid them before him, and Jehu walked upon them as they blew trumpets and shouted, um, Long live Jehu the king! And so as they are laying, I'm sure some of them remembered these stories. And they were excited. This is a new era that is about to start here. And the palm branches. Now, this is something that we don't read about in, in, in Scripture, but a couple of years earlier, there had been another situation, a really significant situation, where there was this man named uh, Judas Maccabeus. And he had, brought about, he had brought about, and there'd been this big revolt, and they had overthrown um, another pagan oppression that had happened. And as... Um, this guy walked in, came into the city triumphant. They all waved palm branches. And this had ushered in this period of like 100 years where they were free from being occupied by other kingdoms and they had this time of independence. And so as they're waving those branches and they're putting their cloaks down, some of them would have been piecing together all these different pieces of their history and seeing that this was a very significant moment. Now something that surprises me about this story as well is that this was the first time, as I said earlier, that Jesus really allowed people to honor him as king and a Messiah publicly like this. And I want to give you a couple examples of where Jesus really tried to stop people from doing this. So back in Matthew chapter 9, there's a story where there's these two blind people and they see Jesus coming. Now, I don't know how they pieced this together. They were, they were blind, but they had heard about Jesus and somehow they thought, you know what, this must be the one to come. And so they shouted out, have mercy on us, son of David. Son of David, that's that Messiah, that's that, that's that, um, those, about all those prophecies that we had talked about. And you know what Jesus says? Well, firstly, he heals them. But then Jesus says, see that no one knows about this. Don't tell anyone. Keep this understanding that you've come to, to yourself. And as readers, it's surprising, because we're all, always talking about, telling everyone about Jesus. But here Jesus is like, don't tell everyone about me. Another example, um, a few weeks ago, Lani preached on a passage in Matthew 16 where Peter comes to this moment where he realized that Jesus was the Messiah and he told Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And what did Jesus do immediately afterwards? He acknowledged, yes, you're right, but he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Why was it that Jesus didn't allow them to celebrate him as king previously, but now suddenly it all changes? Why was Jesus so slow in allowing people to really come to this place? Well, here's the thing. At that time in earth's history, being a king was a quick way to get yourself killed. 
Let me give you a couple examples from Jesus' life. So you might remember right at the very beginning of the story of Jesus. Jesus is born. There's these wise men. They come to King Herod and they say, where is this Jesus, the king of the Jews? Now, was King Herod excited about this? No, he was very concerned about this to the point where he orders the execution of all of the babies in Bethlehem. Now, go to the end of Jesus' life. When Jesus is there hanging upon the cross, do you remember the charge that was above Jesus' head there on the cross? The Bible says that above his head they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This is why Jesus was so slow in allowing people to celebrate him as king was because it was a very dangerous thing to be a king in those days. And think about this. From this moment, do you know what happened five days later? Five days after Jesus is honored and celebrated in this way, Jesus is hanging upon the cross. And so the amazing thing about this story is that it's not just that Jesus allowed them to, to, to honor him in this way, knowing that it was going to bring about his, his death upon the cross, but Jesus even initiates this. Jesus is the one who sent for the donkey, not knowing that it would, it would connect all these Old Testament prophecies in people's minds. Jesus is the one who chose the time just as they were going over the crest of the Mount of Olives. Jesus is the one that had orchestrated this whole scene so that he would be recognized and acknowledged as the true king and Messiah of Israel. Why did Jesus do all of this? And what does this reveal to us about who Jesus is? Now, Jesus, he didn't do it because he was looking to be into Jerusalem and up the palace upon a throne. But Jesus did this knowing that it was going to lead him to his cross. When Jesus got on the donkey... He was making the decision to get on the cross. I think of this scene. Everyone else is there. They're looking at Jerusalem. In their mind, their hopes and their dreams are going wild with, with visions of, of what is going to come next. And they're imagining times, better times, wealthier times, more prosperous times. But at the same time that they're thinking that, Jesus is there on the donkey. And what is he realizing is about to happen next? His death upon the cross. More than this, Jesus, I imagine him looking around and seeing all of those little lambs that are coming with people on this, this, these pilgrims to Passover. And Jesus sees in each one of them a picture of what is going to happen to him where he would be the true sacrificial lamb. And the beautiful thing about this story is that Jesus does get on that donkey. Jesus is the king that is being celebrated, but he's there not for honor. He's there to save those people. And it's interesting that phrase, Hosanna, that we read about that they cried out. It's also something from the Old Testament and it means save us, save us. And these people are saying, save us, save us, save us, Jesus. And yes, and so he's like saying, yes, I'm going to save you. Maybe not in the way that you picture, but I'm going to save you in the way that you really, really need because I love you so much. And so Jesus is the king who got on that donkey because of how much love he has for us. And so there's the story. I hope that sort of helped it come alive for you a little bit. And it brings us to that key question that we talked about at the beginning. Well, now that we've understood what it meant for the people who originally lived it, what does this mean for us today? What does this story mean for us today? Well, the first thing this story means for me is this story for me is a reminder that we have a king that is like no other. Jesus is king. Jesus is the most powerful being in the universe. He's the one with all the power, with all the authority, with all the glory, the one who created us, the one who sustains all things. He's the one who deserves all the glory. And in our world, we have many powerful people, but behind them sits a king, Jesus, who is king over all. And this story is a reminder that that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. But this story also reminds us that just not only is Jesus king, but he is king like no other. He's an upside-down king. He's a king 
that gets on the donkey, not in order to be, um, to be honored when he comes into the city, but knowing that it's going to go to the cross. He's a king that finds greatness, not in being praised, but in serving others. I, I really love what hap- the way Jesus describes this in the previous chapter to what we've just been reading about in Matthew chapter 20. Where Jesus calls his disciples together and he says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the kind of king that Jesus is, a king who finds greatness not in being honored, but in service. A king who loves us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his life so that one day we can live eternally with him. So this story reminds me of that Jesus is a king like no other. We can trust in him. He's given everything for us. Now, like those people in the story, our situation might not go the way that we envision or that we planned, but what we can know with total certainty is that Jesus that we serve He has our future secured. He has our best interests in mind. And he is bringing about a salvation and a kingdom for us that is better than we can possibly imagine. The second thing that this story means to me is that this story for me really invites us into a place of worship. Now on that day, here are all these people celebrating, Jesus is King, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of David, Hosea, Hosea, Hosea they there had realized who Jesus was and for them it brought about this incredible moment where they just wanted to worship Jesus in response. Now, I love some of the things they did in in doing this, um, especially the the cloaks on the ground. Now, when we think about cloaks, we think about clothing, we have so many clothing, so many pieces of clothing in our wardrobes that to throw one of them away wouldn't mean that much to us. But in these days, they didn't have the machinery that could mass produce clothing like we had. So even though cloaks were common, they were very valuable to people, and most people would have only had one. And just picture them them taking off their cloaks, these valuable things, which was the thing that meant comfort for them in the middle of winter, like we have here in Melbourne, and laying them down on that dirty ground to be crunched into that ground by a donkey. Here are these people who are taking something that is valuable to them, placing it before Jesus, so that it might bring Jesus honor and glory. And for me, that is just such a beautiful picture of this place of worship that I think this story invites us into. This story invites us to take who we are, to take what we have. Now, it might not be much, and we might not know all the answers. We might still be confused in all sorts of things, but to take what we are, to recognize who Jesus is, and to lay these things before Jesus for his honor. Now, for you... That might be your job, it might be your relationships, it might be your family, your talents, your time, all sorts of things. It might just be your life as a whole. This story invites us to bring that to Jesus, to place it at his feet, and to say, Jesus, I want my life to bring you honor and glory. And I love this picture of serving God because sometimes it's easy to fall in a trap where we serve God because we want to somehow win his affection Other times we serve God because we think that in doing that we're going to earn something from God. But I love this place where where we serve God not because of what we're going to get get from God, but out of this place of worship where we simply are recognizing who Jesus is and out of hearts full of appreciation and awe for Jesus and hearts full of worship for Jesus, we simply lay our lives, we lay our hearts before Him and we say, God, take my life and may it be something that brings you glory and honor. And so with that in mind, I want to invite you into a place of worship now. I'd like to invite our musicians up to the front, because we're going to sing a song called The Stand. And while they're coming up, I want to just read to you the first uh, few stanzas that in this song, because this song is really about what we've been talking about. It's about recognizing who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and to offering our lives and our hearts to him and worship. So these are the words. You stood before creation, eternity in your hands. And you spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. This is a celebration 
that we serve a Jesus who is king and creator of all. It then goes on to say, oh, I've lost it there, but it talks about how, um, how Jesus lived and died for us and then it invites us to offer our hearts to Jesus, to place them before Jesus in worship and honor of him. And that's what I invite you to do today.